Hi everyone, thank you for joining. So we'll just begin in some seconds. We'll just have a, enough number of attendees trickle down and thanks for joining everyone. Um, so good morning, good evening, wherever you guys are. Uh, hello and welcome to our webinar, How to Build Personalized Marketing Chatbots, Gemini versus Laura. Uh, my name is Yukti Devedi and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. So one of my main jobs here at Single Store is to organize weekly AI webinars. We organize two or three webinars per week and we demonstrate different data and AI use cases with trending tools and technologies. Also, I post about our webinars, uh, up upcoming webinars every week. So if any of these topics are interesting to you, please feel free to RSVP right now. And... Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn to stay on top of the loop. Also, I'd like to hear your feedback on any future sessions or today's session or any ideas on topics that you'd like to see uh, coming up. So please feel to connect with anyone from the team. So speaking of future sessions, we've got amazing sessions coming up. So if you can just move to the next slide, uh, Vinija, the next one. Okay, next one. Got it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so please uh, head to our website and you can scan the QR code as well. That'll be nice to see as well. So just as Yukti mentioned, um, Single Stores Database offers a lot of great information there and a lot of great access too for storing um, all of your machine learning and development needs here. Um, this is some great information going on and all, just talking about all of its capabilities here. Um, it handles vector spaces. It handles normal traditional SQL queries. So um, real-time analytics, applications, um, you can run it anywhere on um, cloud, AWS, whatever you need to integrate with. So let's with that, let's get started with the topic for today. Um, today, what we're mostly looking for is the use case of LLMs within marketing. Um, just quickly going through the agenda here, we'll look at marketing, different ways to personalize it, prompting, parameter efficient fine tuning, and we'll leverage the single store notebooks to do all of that. So in this webinar, what we're really looking to do is go over building personalized customer chatbots with a focus on the marketing, uh, marketing as a use case. Um, LLMs need no introduction. If you're here, you already have some idea of, about the power of these models. Um, so LLMs in marketing specifically, LLMs are invaluable for their ability to understand and generate human-like text, um, enabling advancements in applications of uh, NLP. So specifically within uh, marketing, what LLMs are really used for are both intent recognition as well as sentiment classification. And in terms of intent classification, you can think of it as um, buying, seeking information. What are your users really looking to do? Are they looking to leverage your LL your technologies and are they do they have the intention to buy? Do they have the intention to um, get more information? Understanding that intent and understanding what your customers are actually looking to do can help you better structure your product towards them in order to get them to go from seeking the information to actually becoming an end customer. Sentiment analysis is also what uh, marketing or LLMs in marketing are used for. So you kind of want to understand what the sentiment is around your product, positive, negative, neutral. Um, and this is kind of really important to monitor your brand, um, to get any customer feedback, to have that feedback loop to continue to iterate and keep improving your product. So these are the two use cases we'll start looking at today as well. Before we start, I kind of wanted to talk about what the data in um, marketing use case would really look like. So we talked about the two use cases here. We talked about intent as well as sentiment classification. These are the links on Hugging Face that you can look at the data set, but basically what the intent classification data set has is it labels different um, sentences that you'll have with zero, one, or um, depending on whether you have negative, positive, or neutral intent. What the um, 
so th that's the uh, that's the sentiment classification. The what the intent classification will do is it'll take your sentence and actually try to understand what you're talking about, whether you're talking about something positive, whether you're talking about some COVID case, whether you're talking about shopping. It really looks to pull out and understand that information. There's also marketing specific data sets available, so I would highly recommend checking these data sets out for your own trial use case um, after this webinar. So now let's really get into the topics here. So what we're really gonna look at is how do we personalize an LLM for our specific needs? And in the industry, there's really two ways to adapt and personalize LLMs. There's prompting, and then there's also fine tuning. So in terms of prompting, what it really involves is, it just involves providing the specific instructions within the input of the model. So you think of ChatGPT, you think of Llama, you think of Gemini. Um, as you're interacting with the LLM, you're just feeding it the information within its prompt, and then you're asking it to generate a personalized response. So the benefit of this is, you know, there's no code needed here. There's immediate adaptation here. Um, no, no information that you need to really give to the LLM outside of just feeding it the prompt. But of course, that comes with its cons, which is um, you control over model behavior, right? So you don't really get to control the model's behavior as much. You can potentially have inconsistent results for complex tasks. Um, you really need to evaluate how this performs based on your use case and see if this is um, kind of the path that you can go down. But if you're seeing that the evaluation here within prompting is not great, then the next option is fine tuning. And with fine tuning, what we're looking to do is update the model's actual parameters. So what you're looking to do is basically take the model and feed it your task and update its weights in order to learn your new task. So the benefit here, of course, is that it's more task specific here, the performance will improve the con and it will have consistent output for every time you give it the same example, it will have consistent output. Of course, that comes with the downside that it will require more computational resources and an even larger data set in order to work um, as correctly as we want. Generally, fine tuning does produce better results than prompting, but it does come with a lot of computation costs. So I would recommend going towards prompting first, evaluating your um, LLM use case, and then moving on towards fine tuning. So let's dive deeper into each of these topics first. Um, with prompting, we what we're looking to do is we're looking to take a pre-trained language model off the shelf with specific instructions or examples that will feed to it to kind of get it to respond in the way we are looking to do. And what we're looking to do is to kind of make it a versatile for various different tasks that we have. In doing so, we can leverage view shot learning. And that's the demo we'll go over today, where we feed in a small number of examples into the model as a prompt to guide the model in the general direction of how we want our output to be produced. Um, many shot is also an option where we kind of give it an even larger set of examples to kind of, to further improve its abilities and performance on its information. Both of these approaches are um, very great for the tasks that you're looking for. And there's actually a paper by DeepMind that came out um, last month, it's called Many Shot in Context Learning. I would definitely recommend um, giving a look to that. And what they've done is they've shown that feeding now with um, LLMs having even larger context length, you can feed it many examples. And what that's doing is it's getting an even better output result um, since you're giving it even more examples. So it's able to adhere to what you're looking for um, even better than few shot. There's more, um, if you wanna learn more about prompting, I have a blog, venetia.ai, feel free to check it out. Um, there's other prompting techniques there as well. Now, the question comes up whether we're looking at pre-training and fine-tuning or full fine-tuning. So just kind of wanted to clarify that, and then we'll delve into perimeter-efficient fine-tuning as well. So 
Pre-training and fine-tuning um, paradigms first involved training the model on large data sets. Um, after pre-training, the model adapts to specific tasks, which is done through a larger data set, but a task-specific data set, which is um, done via fine-tuning. And what fine-tuning do does is it updates all of the model's parameters with the new task that you feed to the model. So what this will do is it'll leverage the general knowledge abilities of the model that it has during pre-training while also kind of um, specializing it towards this new task you have. The one con that I didn't mention that can happen during fine tuning is catastrophic forgetting, um, which means that sometimes the model can actually forget the original task it was trained on. So that's also a con that we need to keep in mind. So full fine tuning up involves updating all of the parameters of the pre-trained model to adapt it to tasks or the specific data set. And this will require a significant amount of computational resources, time, especially for the larger models. Um, and what we're gonna look at today is Gemini. So it's definitely true for that use case. But there's a solution to that as well. And that's where parameter efficient fine tuning comes in. So what parameter efficient fine tuning involves is only involves updating a subset of the parameters of the pre-trained model. This allows you to have efficiency as well as it reduces computational costs significantly. Um, there's a few key points here. So there's, re there's many reasons to use parameter efficient fine tuning over full fine tuning, computational resources, efficiency, the models updating less weights than it needs to with full fine tuning. There's selective adjustments. Only certain layers or parameters are fine tuned depending on which parameter efficient fine tuning technique you use. Um, efficiency, it reduces the number of parameters that need to be updated and then transfer learning. Parameter efficient fine tuning um, kind of enables quick task adaptation models for new tasks without extensive retraining. So you can also actually um, train it on two tasks at once, three tasks, however many you need for your use case. So this is a great option for that. And again, if you want to learn more about all of the various techniques, today we'll only cover LoRa, but there are many out there. Feel free to look at Amon's blog or my blog um, on PEFT techniques there. So what we're gonna cover today is LoRa, which is low rank adaptation. This has gained a lot of popularity. There's different flavors of LoRa available now as well. There's quantized versions, many, many different versions, but today we'll look at vanilla LoRa. Um, and first let's talk about how it works and um, how it really helps with uh, fine tuning capabilities. So what is LoRa? LoRa is um, a technique used to fine-tune pre-trained models by introducing these low-rank matrices into the, model, into the model's architecture. So it allows for efficient adaptation to new tasks with minimal parameter updates. So if you want to see this image from the original paper that introduced LoRa, what you can see here is you have your original pre-trained weights, the weights that the model already has from its pre-trained task that it was um, pre-trained on. What LoRa is doing is it's taking these low rank matrices here. R here represents the rank. So it's taking these low rank matrices and all it's doing is it's appending it to the original weights there. And in doing so, when the model now needs to be trained for the new task, it's only actually updating these blocks in the orange and it's not even touching the original weights. So in a sense, those are kept frozen. So instead of updating the entire model's parameter, it only it inserts these low rank matrices as we saw. Um, and these are of much smaller dimensionality. This is where our efficiency comes in. Um, these matrices capture the task specific information at hand. So for marketing, that will be sentiment analysis, intent classification, and it enables efficient fine tuning to happen here. Um, LoRa in doing so significantly reduces the number of parameters that need to be trained, making fine tuning process a lot faster and a lot less resource intensive. So you have additive and 
multiplicative um, updates happening in LoRa, which kind of applies both of these adjustments to the model's weights to ensure the original pre-training knowledge is retained while adapting to new tasks because we're not even essentially touching the original weight. So there's no um, catastrophic forgetting that can happen when you're using LoRa. So let's talk about the advantages that you have from LoRa and its applications. The advantages, as we'd mentioned, there's resource efficiency here. It reduces the computational and memory requirements for fine tuning large models, which as we know, can be intense. Um, speed, you're really getting your, um, you're accelerating your fine tuning process here because you're only updating a small number of parameters only a small number of parameters are being updated. So you're getting your LLM to adapt to your task a lot faster. And there's flexibility. This can be applied to various pre-trained models across different domains, across different tasks. Um, there's really no constraints that LoRa has. Um, it's used within NLP a lot to adapt language models for specific tasks, translation, um, Marketing tasks, as we have here, it's used for computer vision, um, for fine tuning models, for image classification, object detection, segmentation tasks. It's used for speech, um, enhancing models for better handling different dialects or accents um, within speech data. So it's multimodal as well, which is a huge advantage, especially since a lot of the LLMs coming out um, have multimodal technologies now. So now let's quickly jump into the demos. We are going to have two demos today. We're going to look at both the prompting as well as fine tuning. So let me start looking into that. Okay, so first we'll start with prompting and let me know if you can see my screen. I'm assuming the share is still working. Uh, yeah, it's visible. Awesome, perfect then. Um, okay. So the first one we're going to look at, and again, this is the single store notebooks that I'm leveraging and the way I'm running this, it's through their free tier. I'd highly recommend checking it out. Um, it's very easy to get your projects up and running, and they also offer um, some starter code, boilerplate code within their gallery. So don't have to start from scratch for any project very easy to use and you'll have this code available as well right after the webinar so feel free to give it a shot and try it yourself um okay so for this what we're looking to do is have large context prompting with gemini 1.5 pro gemini 1.5 um, has a very large context i believe two million tokens um so we're going to leverage that to do many shop prompting and see how it is able to personalize for our marketing use case here. So just to walk through, we'll import our um, Gemini key, um, we'll install the different packages, and then we have a function here to load the contents from the PDFs, but here's the meat of it. Let's start with the few shot learning. Um, we'll give it about 10 examples here to start with, and this is for sentiment analysis tasks. So just to get through the examples really quick, um, what we have is we'll give a sentence and we'll classify its sentiment as either positive or negative. You can also do neutral. You can add as many sentiments as you wish. So a few examples here. The movie was a fantastic experience. So that's a positive sentiment. That's what we expected to give back. Um, I really enjoyed the storyline and characters, positive. Um, this was a waste of my time, negative. So this is kind of giving a movie review feedback with positive or negative. And this is the um, few shots. So we're giving it about 10, yeah, 10 different examples. And this is what we're going to feed into Gemini as a prompt. So these are the examples we feed and then we give it the task. Now we're saying analyze the sentiments of the following sentences. The visuals were impressive, but the storyline was lackluster. A brilliant piece of cinema that left me speechless. The film was too long. An engaging and well-crafted narrative. So now let's see how to feed this in and how to get the output sentiment classified from Gemini. 
So the code, so now we're going to look at first um, generating these 10K samples from, Ge from Gemini's large context prompt. These are the data set for the positive sentiment. You can definitely feel free to go through it. And then we have the data for the negative sentiments as well. Now we have, those are about 10K samples. So what we'll do is for all of these 10K samples, we'll have the sentiment both positive um, as well as negative, and then we'll randomly shuffle them and store them within our samples that we have created here. Now we're gonna install Google's Vertex, Vertex AI and their generative AI libraries. And that's all that's happening here. Just downloading all of these libraries. And now we're actually looking to have that Gemini text output. So um, what we're looking to do here then is we're gonna start with getting the Gemini's environment variable. So we'll have the API keys here and we'll have it configured. Um, what we're gonna do is give it the key and then have an answer in the format of a text. This is just the function that we've created. And in order to actually run the model, we're going to call this function um, generate response with the model as well as with the prompt. So the model here, we specified as Gemini 1.5 latest. You can, I'd actually recommend trying it out with different models, um, open AIs, um, open source models as well, and just evaluating the different performance you get with FewShot um, and let us know what your findings are specifically for marketing. So what we're doing is we're calling the function that we have here with the model and the prompt. Um, and the prompt, what we had created earlier to classify the sentences, and here's what it looks like. So what we had is the visuals were impressive, but the story was lackluster. The sentiment was negative. So and it also offers a little bit of explainability here. So while there's a positive element, the overall sentiment leans towards negative due to the lackluster. Um, the next sentence, a brilliant piece of cinema that left me speechless. It's positive, clearly expresses strong positive emotions. Um, the film was too long and uninteresting. Negative, both descriptors too long, uninteresting um, are negative an engaging and well-crafted narrative. So this is positive, um, engaging and well-crafted, both leaning towards the positive attributes. So the explainability aspect is also very valuable here, especially as you're creating your product. I've also included additional code that I would definitely recommend going through. And these additional code experiment with, with multimodal prop prompting, as we had talked about earlier, speech, image, text, all together. Um, and they also have the rag to Gemini use case. So not only can you try it with multimodal prompting, you can also actually leverage the rag use case where you have your data stored in a vector database. And every time you get a prompt, you actually look within your vector database for any relevant piece of information that you then leverage to augment your prompt and then feed it into Gemini, giving it even more, um, you can give it more samples with few shot prompting, as well as more context with RAG here. So you can feel free to look through this code. There's um, image inputs to Gemini. Then we're also feeding the videos to Gemini um, here, as well as multimodal. So then we're feeding in both text as well as video into Gemini and then also doing the retrieval aspect here where we're retrieving um, the different relevant informations from our vector database and augmenting our prompt. All of this is using single stores um, vector database to leverage all of this. So then uh, it's easily available right here for you to monitor, for you to just visually see where it lives. Um, so definitely recommend going through all of this code and the extra bit that we haven't ran through here. So this is for large context prompting. Now we're going to look at how to run LoRa here. All right, so the two different ways we were looking to personalize was either prompting or through um, fine tuning. 
but in fine tuning specifically through parameter efficient fine tuning. So for this use case, we're again gonna look at sentiment analysis so we can do an apples to apples comparison with the prompting use case that we looked at earlier. Okay, so to start off with, we're just installing the um, libraries again from Hugging Face here. Just having that run. All right. And now what we're looking, um, we also included all of the PEFT libraries that we're going to leverage. Laura, we're gonna run evaluation, all of that stuff. Um, then we're going to load in for the data set. We're gonna leverage Stanford's sentiment tree bank data set. It's the most commonly used for sentiment analysis. Um, and it will have the sentence as well as the label with it and the ID just so you can see that's kind of what the structure of the data set will look like there. We're just going to load that in um, and have that set. Now that we have the sentiment analysis data set loaded, now we're going to work on loading our model specifically. So now that we have our model here loaded, um, what we're going to do is it's gonna show you um, all of the models being loaded. Now we're gonna do a lot of the data pre-processing and cleaning up the tasks. So you wanna resize, you wanna um, make sure it's truncated. You wanna just make sure your data is clean and indented correctly. That's just um, a lot of the data cleanup that we're doing over there. And then what we're looking to do here is inference with the base model to kind of set up the baseline. So this is what our um, list of examples looks like, just so we kind of have a feel and we can see what it's looking at internally. So let's look at the few examples here. A feel-good picture in the best sense of term. Resourceful, ingenious entertainment, um, unless you're in dire need of diesel fix. Impression impresses you with its open-endedness and surprise. Um, and then what we're going to look, we're just going to print right now the untrained models predictions. So what we're doing is a baseline comparison before fine tuning and how it works just out of the box. So this is the untrained models prediction. We're just going through this text list that we have. We're going through and giving it to the model. And then what we want to do is output the predictions. We'll output the text as well as the ID and the predictions. Okay, so the sentences that we had looked at already, a feel good picture is the best sense of the term. Positive sentiment here. Um, resourceful, ingenious entertainment, positive. The movie's biggest offense is its complete and utter lack of tension. It deems it as positive. Um, may not be fully correct there, impresses you with its open-endedness and surprise positive, unless you're in dire need of diesel fuel, there's no real reason to see it positive. So as you can kind of see, it's classifying all of these sentences in the sample that we had taken to positive. So out of the box, untrained, we're not seeing a great performance. Um, that's good to know that out of the box, the sentiment analysis is working not well. So even with few shot prompting, we were seeing great results, but out of the box, it's not working well. Now let's evaluate it against our fine tuned model and see how it changes there. All right, so we'll update our um, parameter efficient fine tuning configuration here. Um, we have the dropout, we have uh, Laura's alpha set, we have the rank set. Um, you can play around with these hyperparameters as well and see what really works your use case. This is what it, we have as default. Now we're going to get the, um, we'll have our get parameter efficient fine tuning model function call here with our model as well as our config that we have set there. And we printed out the config just in case you'd like to see it internally. Um, there's a lot of different inputs and flavors that go within um, Laura's configurations, and you can look to manipulate in different kinds and see how it works for your use case. But for now, we're looking at the default um, values here. Okay. 
then we're setting the hyperparameter, the bat size, the number of epochs it will be trained for. Then we'll define the training arguments that we have. So what we'll have is the checkpoints um, and we'll append the LoRa text classification to it. We'll have the learning rate, um, bat sizes, weight decay, number of training epochs, evaluation strategies, um, saving strategies, loading the best model at the end. Then we're going to now select a subset of the full data set that we have. So, and we'll split it between the train and we'll and eval. You don't wanna use the same data set, of course, for both train and eval. Um, you'll introduce a bias there. So you want to split your data set before you start. Then here, we're just creating a trainer object to run train on, right? And now what we're going to start looking at in this section is the inference with the fine-tuned model. So now what we have is, now we've fine-tuned our model there with LoRa, and let's look at how it performs versus how we had um, it perform initially. So now we're going to output train model predictions and we're going to look at all of the sentiments that we had earlier and see the output. So here we have a feel good picture is the best sense of the term, positive, resourcefulness and ingenious entertainment, positive. It's an incredibly dull, it's just incredibly dull, negative. Um, the movie's biggest offense is it's complete and utter lack attention, negative. Uh, impresses you with its open-endedness and surprise, positive. Unless you're in dire need of diesel fuel, there's no real reason to see it negative. So as you can see, after fine-tuning, we're able to get better performance. And just to kind of um, explain the differences here, what we've done between the different prompting strategies and different and fine-tuning, and when I would recommend doing each. To start off with for your use case, I would definitely recommend first trying off like how we did for our um, fine tuning use case to start with out of the box performance and see how it performs. We had seen that the performance was not so well. We were seeing that the labels were not being set correctly here. And in, if you would like to see what it looks like internally, this is what the data set looks like for intent. So for intent, you'll have a sentence, um, thank you, goodbye. The intent it will classify as goodbye. Can you turn the volume down, volume control, um, COVID cases, COVID. So it's basically able to understand intent. Same way for sentiment analysis, you'll have the, the data set will have sentiment as well as numerical values that corresponds to each sentiment, positive, negative, um, one, negative one, zero for neutral, if you choose to have neutral in there. So that's what the data set will look like out of the box. But what we saw here was that sentiment analysis out of the box, we were not getting great results. What we were getting was um, all of the sentences were getting out to be positive. In that case, then what I would start with is um, prompting strategies. What we looked at here was few shot prompting, but um, the DeepMind paper that talked about many shot prompting you can even leverage that for your use case um, to give it not just 10 samples, you can give it multiple samples. The context length is a lot larger and you can even think beyond just text here. So not just text, perhaps your use case, um, for your use case, you can give it images, you can give it videos along with text captions and then ask it to classify sentiment to give you an even richer answer and richer output for your use case. And we have that code available here as well for the multimodal input into Gemini. See how that works. Um, see what results you're getting here. Evaluate it against your ground truth that you have. And in order to enhance that even further, what you can use is your RAG pipeline, for which we also have the code available down here. With that, what you can do is um, as you have even more examples, or perhaps you have even more images or new videos coming in for your product, um, new speech coming in, maybe you have 
um, an Alexa device or a speech assistant, and you want to understand the sentiment of that as well, along with the text, along with the images, along with all of the other modalities, you can store that within your vector database. And what you can do is as you prompt, as the user looks to query and understand, um, you can kind of find that similarity, pull out the relevant bits of information from your vector database, feed it into the prompt along with your examples and enhance it even further. And you'll get an even more refined output for your sentiment analysis there. And this is still all prompting strategies, all different prompting um, strategies that you can do, whether it be multimodal or just text-based, whether with RAG or without. Um, to and with few shot or many shot, um, all prompting strategies that you can leverage for your use case. And if you are still not getting great evaluation there, then I would recommend moving over to uh, fine tuning by leveraging a parameter efficient fine tuning first. Here we looked at LoRa. There's also quantized LoRa, which will actually take the original model's weight that we had seen and it will quantize that since we're not looking to update that. Um, and that just helps you kind of be even more efficient there. You can look at a few other strategies in terms of um, fine tuning and just kind of understand the how it's performing and compare it with your baseline prompting strategies. If you're seeing great results here, then this, is, this would be a fantastic um, way to proceed forward. The only issue with um, going with a fine tuning use case is you kind of have a cutoff. If you have a data set where you have data coming in more frequently um, and you need to update it rapidly, then perhaps going with the prompting strategy works best since you're able to manipulate the different examples you're feeding into the model. Um, if your examples are changing quite often, if not, and if you have a finite set of data set and a finite use case, then this is the way to go there. Um, and with that, um, I think we can open the floor to any questions now. Thank you, Vinija. We actually have a lot of open questions for you. Awesome. So. Uh, I'll just pick out a question. Atmal, you can also pick out a question in case you want to take up anything. So, yeah, uh, I, I think a lot of questions about your model, Vinija, um, your choice of model, uh, and uh, what you know, what was used to generate the sentiment, for example. So, yeah, absolutely. So, what we used to gen to generate the sentiment were different data sets here. We have Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank, um, as well as I believe I'd mentioned in our slides as well, the link to our data sets that we had leveraged. There's a lot of different um, data sets that you can find on Hugging Face. So here's the sentiment, and then there's the intent classification. I can share links to this as well. And basically what it looks like here is you'll have the different sentences, and then these are just the IDs to have them stored. And then the label classifies them as negative, positive, or neutral. Um, so that's what we use to leverage. Um, and then we had leveraged here, Gemini for prompting, um, the different sentiment analysis. Yeah, does that kind of cover the question? And this is what the data also looks like for the prompting use case. Great. Uh, you see, you've just disappeared. <laughs> Where are you? Oh, no, I'm Hugging. right here. <laughs> I'm right here. Okay. So... Yeah, I think, yes, I was just going to say, there's a, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, so uh, I think there's a couple of points here. Uh, Mosin made a, a, a comment here. Um, RAG is also another option. And then similarly, um, there's a, a comment here. It says, why don't you mention RAG like another strategy to guide the models, for example, Vinija? So just some thoughts there on the utilizing RAG in, in combination with what, you, what you've done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that would be definitely one way to go. And we've actually provided the code for that here as well, um, as well as using images and videos with RAG as well. I would definitely agree that that would be a great strategy. Uh, we were looking at few shot prompting for personalization here. 
Um, RAG is another way to go. We have prior webinars where we've already discussed RAG, so we didn't want to go through that code here again, but a great strategy to leverage that and the code is available. I would highly recommend, especially if your data is ever changing, to store it in single stores vector databases and have that feed into your prompt. So, All right, I'll um, go quiet now, Yukti, so you can take over. No worries, no worries at all. Just feel free to say it anytime. Yeah. I think you're going to say something, so I'll, I'll <laughs> mute myself now. So uh, we have one question from Manideep Ji. He says, do we need GCP access to connect Vertex AI and deploy sentimental analysis mode? Um, do you need GCP access? This I'm running locally. I'm not using GCP. Um, if you're looking to just have your application just do a test locally, then fine. But depending on your business and use case, if you are using Google Cloud to deploy, then definitely you would need access to that. But if you just want to do a test locally, um, you can have this code available and just run it in single store itself. Sounds good. So, um, we have one question from Shivani. Uh, she says, which baseline model is used to generate the sentiment? Is any instruction provided to get the result for the sentiment in the baseline? Yeah, absolutely. So I believe she's talking about the fine tuning use case. And for fine tuning, we weren't able to use Gemini because we um, can't fine tune it locally. So what we did here is um, in order to just run it um, first, the question was to see if we provided any instructions for the baseline. No, we didn't. We didn't provide any instructions to the baseline because what we want to do is test how the model works without any instructions. And as we saw, it didn't work very well. Um, and then we fine tuned it with Laura and then we saw great results. And the model that we leveraged, yeah, the model that we leveraged here was, I believe, Roberta Base. Akmal, do you want to pick out a question? Uh, I was just going to answer as a um, question for Vinod Jain. Uh, is the single store trial version available? Uh, so I think, uh, Vinijay, you mentioned that already that you were, was it the free tier you were using? Uh, yes. Am I correct? Yes, correct. So this Well, is that's awesome if you are. Uh, because <laughs> uh, No, because uh, that means that, uh, you know, although we offer the sign up version with the $600 credits as well, if the free tier is good enough, I mean, then it, you get instantaneous access. It, it, yeah. There's no time you have to wait in terms of provisioning resources. It just comes up literally in a second and you get a database as well and so on. So I, I was just going to answer the question, but that, that is something that came up just there. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I've run both of these on the free tier. So it was very easy to start up. The notebooks are available. The gallery code, I really appreciate. It helps you just start off with... Um, Everything is available right here, monitoring everything in one spot. It makes it very easy to use. So I think we have a question from Masood. He says, can you use local models like Olama? So we had a webinar that Akmal hosted on Olama. So uh, <laughs> Akmal, would you like to answer this question? Yeah. Oh, um, okay. So for Olama, I think... Uh, at the moment, and I think I mentioned this before, uh, no promises, but we are looking into providing local access to that, yes, within the uh, compute uh, environment that we have uh, with single store, plus a range of models as well. Uh, that will make it much easier for you as a developer because uh, you don't then have to s set up a local environment. Um, for those that attended the webinar that I did, you know I struggled. My poor Mac was struggling in terms of resources and running Olama, uh, not so much the software itself, but the size of the model, which I think was, uh, uh, I was using something around 3.8 gigabytes in size and uh, running it in a virtual machine. So double whammy there. Um, but uh, essentially it, it works well, uh, ultimately, but you know, add a bit of sort of a horsepower to it bit of compute resources to it. And I think that will really work well. And as I said before, we're engineering is looking into that. Um, hopefully there'll be a response and some solution to that in the very near future. We do have other things that uh, the announcement, you you know, for the, uh, the unfreeze your uh, data lake and iceberg is uh, somewhat of a priority for us right now. All right. Thank you, Akmal. So uh, Vinisha, we have one question from George is one of the first questions uh, in the webinar. So he says, how is possible to choose what parameters can be, must be used to satisfy the goal of the model? 
Yeah, absolutely. And if there was a golden answer for that, I don't think we would need a lot of um, hyperparameter experimentation. But unfortunately, there's not one set answer determining what values you need. There's kind of a lot of experimentation you need to do, but I would recommend starting off with the default values, see how it works, and then look to tune it. We actually have a very good question from Rajesh. He says, does this accommodate slightly different sentiments across different cultures? Certain keywords in certain cultures might be positive and certain keywords might be negative in some cultures, right? It's a very good question, Rajesh. Yeah, yeah, very great question. Yes, absolutely. So the same code will work for different sentiment. All you'll need to change is the data you're feeding in. So in terms of prompting, um, just give it examples of the different sentiments and cultural specific needs that you're um, wanting it to output as well as in terms of fine tuning, then you can't use um, the sentiment analysis from Stanford's data set. You'll have to create your own um, to have it kind of output what sentiments and culturally aware sentiments you're looking for. But great question there, yeah. Yeah, so moving on, we have one question from Vinay. It's about the weights that you have used. So can you please explain the low rank matrix of the weights and how the layers are added? Yeah, absolutely. So let me go back to that image um, from the paper that we have. So this is basically the low rank matrices that we have added. So um, as you saw in the code earlier, we had specified our rank here and it was the default values. What, it, what it's doing here are, these are the two matrices that we are adding in. And I mean, internally in the code, it's a library call. So you don't really need to understand how it's working, but just to, um, just to, for your knowledge here, what it's doing is when you specify the rank, you're also specifying its dimensionality of these two matrices. And these two matrices are the new weight matrices for our sentiment task. So you can think of this as the original task the model was trained on. We're adding the sentiment task here and appending it to the original weights. And now as we're training or fine tuning the model, only this is being updated. So you're now um, kind of tuning a lower dimensionality of weights versus you if you were just training this entire thing earlier, if that helps. Um, I would also recommend reading the original paper if you want to specifics on how they came up with this strategy. All right, sounds good. So uh, any relevant assets will be sent uh, during the follow-up email. So please don't worry, we'll make sure to include this and uh, Moving on to the next questions, we have one question from Jaspal Saguja. He says, how do we establish quantitative metrics for evaluating and comparing LLMs? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So there's a lot of metrics that are already available. Um, whether you're just looking at precision, depends on really on your use case um, that you're looking for here. In terms of sentiment, if you're just looking at precision, um, accuracy, these could be leveraged. Um, you can look at more kind of um, semantic metrics. There's BERT score, um, mover score, just in terms of uh, the language output, if you're not looking to output one or zero, if you're looking to output um, positive with explainability, as we saw in Gemini, then perhaps you want a more um, semantic metric. So then BERT score, mover score would be there. Um, you can also just kind of um, compare it against any, as in terms of when you're training it, compare it with the ground truth, see how well it's performing there. So those are the few things. You can also have human in the loop and have them rank how it's performing the output sentiments. Um, there's a lot of different categories that you can look at, and it really depends on what output you have and um, what you're looking to do. So if you have numerical output, then you're really looking for accuracy there. If you have text output, then you don't want as much accuracy because there's different ways of phrasing things. So you want semantic similarity where if someone says this is positive or this is a good sentence, there's semantic similarity of positive there. So then you want to use more semantic metrics. All right. So Akmal, this is one question for you. Uh, Tejas says, how do we load this notebook on single store? Is there any reference link that we might have? Oh, yes, it's very easy. So essentially from the portal, uh, you'll see that once you've logged in and uh, you, you know you follow the link that uh, Yuxi shared uh, earlier and posted into the chat, 
once you've created your account, essentially you've got um, a left navigation pane on the left hand side, which has got SQL editor, notebooks, a variety of other things that you can do. Uh, and you, all you do is just click on the notebook one. And then within that on the top right hand side is a button uh, which says new notebook. If you click on that, it, it gives you the opportunity to upload a notebook as well, rather than just creating a new one from scratch. So it's very straightforward. Uh, the uh, the user interface should be self-explanatory. Um, and then the the Jupyter Notebook, IPython Notebook, you just load it up there and you'll be able to run it. But you do need to provision some compute resources first. So essentially, as Venetia was saying, you know, create your um, free tier, uh, you know, compute resources. That's the quickest way. Literally within about a second, you'll have something up and running. Um, and that will give you a great way to uh, get started very, very quickly. A matter of uh, minutes, even less perhaps. Uh, all right. So we have one question from Divya Prakash. She says, how can I use this in a bank application and please suggest the best way to train it using a bank data securely? That's awesome because I believe Monday's webinar is about banking specifically. That's why I picked this question. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I would recommend coming in and checking it out Monday. But um, for this specifically, if you're looking for a banking use case, um, this we're looking at sentiment analysis and intent classification. So um, just change the data set again for any conversations, anything that's ha happening within bank. If your task is something different from sentiment analysis or intent classification, if you're looking for a chatbot interaction happening for banking application, then stay tuned for Monday. Yeah, please, uh, you know, register for the Monday webinar. It's on FinTech only. So uh, we hope to see you there. Like your question will be definitely answered in great detail during that webinar. So yeah, cool, please. I see your hand. Yeah, I was just saying, I, I knew I downloaded this previously. So this is the, uh, uh, Venetia, and please correct me if I'm mistaken, but your paper, Unveiling Hallucination in Text, Image, Video, and Audio Foundation Models, a Comprehensive Review. It's kind of related resources there. So you posted that on LinkedIn. I actually followed the link and downloaded it. So that mm -hmm. might be something very useful as well for people to read. Yeah, absolutely. There's um I, I've also actually published research on culturally aware uh, vision language models. So I really appreciated that question as well. That's something I've been kind of working and researching on as well. Yeah, yeah I, I used um, uh, Whisper from OpenAI, the free version that's available on GitHub. And mm -hmm. they've got a very good analysis in terms of the languages that it supports well, for example. So uh, things like Spanish and English are better supported. Mm -hmm. South Asian languages less well supported. Yeah. And therefore, uh, I mean, use it by all means, but be aware of the limitations in terms Absolutely. of what the software can do. Uh, so, I mean, it's great to see that, uh, uh, as you say, you know, some of these cultural language specific things are being introduced into these models because, the, you know, the world is far more than the English speaking Absolutely. world, for example. Um, uh, so yeah, great, great to see all this uh, uh, research. Yeah. You guys can check out Vinija's Google, Google Scholar <laughs> profile. If you are interested in any of the research that she's been doing, it's amazing. It's super interesting. If anyone is into uh, academia, like definitely head over to her profile and just check out whatever she has published. It's super cool. So <laughs> moving on to like a new question. So uh, just let, get, let, give me a second. So we have one question from David. Uh, how do you handle possible underfitting or overfitting that can occur when you train your model? Absolutely. So there's a, there's two different ends of the spectrum. Underfitting, um, different things you can look at. Maybe you want to train for more epochs. I believe I had shown you the epochs when we were fine tuning there. Train it for longer. Um, see if you need more data. Perhaps you don't have enough data. Look at any outliers you have. Um, just see, ba basically, underfitting means that the model hasn't truly understood the different patterns within your data set, and it's not able to classify the output correctly. So I would look to augment the data set or in add in more examples and train for longer and see how that works. Under um, That's underfitting. Overfitting means that now you the model has kind of memorized um, the different patterns and the different uh, 
nuances within the data set. So what you want to basically look at is augmenting the data set always helps in terms of your um, model evaluation there and either train for longer, train for shorter. If it's overfitting, then you want to train for a shorter number of epochs, um, train for longer if it's underfitting. Just try um, different experimentations and see how it works. All right, sounds good. So we have one more question from Vanessa Lopez. She says, have you tried to expand context of open source models? Did you manage to achieve good results? Or did you see answers uh, quality deteriorate? Yeah, um, a great question. So I have, uh, I have not personally expanded the context length, but I have leveraged expanded context length of current models. Um, so yes, there have been great results. Basically, it's very intuitive, right? If you feed it in a lot more information, if you feed it in a lot more examples, you will only get a better output, a better um, refined output there. If you're feeding in fewer examples, um, you're going to get a marginally less effective output there. It's You can kind of think of it intuitively too. The more examples you see when of something new that you're learning, the better you'll perform on that task. Versus if you only see a fewer examples and then you go to do that task, you may not perform as well as if you had seen many. So it's very intuitive in that nature. Um, the larger context links definitely very helpful in terms of um, going towards the prompting strategies earlier when there were shorter context length, fine tuning was often the only way you could go in order to personalize your applications. All right. It seems like we are almost at the top of the hour. So if it's all right, uh, sorry, everyone, we are not able to answer all the questions. The almost We are at, actually at the top of the hour. So thank you so much, Manija. I think it's good to wrap this up. So I have some announcements to make before I announce today's raffle winner. So can you please go to the slide where uh, the webinars are displayed? Yeah. So thanks, Manija, for joining. Thanks, Akmul, for joining and answering these questions for us. So just a few quick notes before we announce today's raffle winner. So we've got amazing sessions that are coming up on June 3rd. We have using open source copilot for personalized banking applications. This is the FinTech webinar we were talking about. Please feel free to check this out. And any questions regarding to banking, FinTech will be answered here. So, and on June 4th, we have choosing best fit embeddings for your AI app, OpenAI, Minstrel, Llama, et cetera. Uh, on June 5, we have Zapier Central plus single store, amazing experts coming in. Please feel free to uh, RSVP right now. And on June 26, we have unfreeze your iceberg data. Uh, this is something that is there on the previous slide. If you can just go there, Vinija. And uh, uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, so this is what I'm talking about. Please feel free to RSVP to this one as well. Uh, you, you just need to register. You might not, I understand this event is a little further in time, but to use, if you just register, you can get the relevant assets, which I feel like will be pretty helpful for anyone who's interested. So if any of these topics are interesting, please RSVP right now. I'll see you all there. So the announcement that everyone's been waiting for, today's raffle winners. So randomly selected, we have Jagat Iswara Murthy. He's an application system engineer at Wells Fargo. Congrats and thanks for joining, sir. Uh, and everyone, if this is not you, do not give up. We are going to announce one more AirPods and Meta's Ray-Ban winner by the end of the day. So if anyone who has tried out today's demo during the session and has signed up using the link that is also present on your chat, uh, uh, on your screen or you can just scan the QR code right now and just be eligible uh, and be entered to win. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Vinija and Akmal, for joining this session. We really value your time and energy. It was such a fun session. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great rest of the day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, folks. Bye-bye. Bye.